Hey everybody, this is uh, going to be our fifth topic in the EMR series. Uh, I'm recording an asynchronous video lesson so that you can follow along at your own pace. Um, this is a lesson that I actually used to do uh, as part of a larger series of lessons, and I've split it into, into two halves. And so you may uh, come across notes that uh, the slides are in different orders. Anyways, that kind of explains this why. I used to actually do this lesson along with the photoelectric effect, and I've decided that uh, it'll probably be easier to do it in, in two pieces instead. And so anyways, let's get right to it here. Um, again, as with all of my asynchronous videos, the goal and purpose behind this is to give you the freedom and flexibility to work at your own pace rather than going at the pace of the teacher. And at the average speed of the class, you can you know, go a little faster if you'd like, maybe go a little bit slower. Um, you can rewind and pause. And so let's begin. Um, we're going to continue our history lesson and the story that we have that comes to the discovery of electromagnetic radiation. Um, ideally, the previous three lessons should have been on reflection, refraction, diffraction, and interference. And the idea that light is a wave that has the ability to, to have all of these properties, the ability to bounce off of surfaces, ref reflection, refract through different mediums, so that's to bend, refraction. It has the ability as a wave to overlap on itself because of the fact that it diffracts and spreads outwards and can eventually interfere and create an interference pattern as was discovered in the year 1800 by Thomas Young in the double slit experiment. And so I want to take you back to our history lesson. We're going to go to about the year 1900, the turn of the 20th century. And before I get to my notes, I, I want to point out some historical context that's happened. Um, if I have a timeline on, on the whiteboard at some point, hopefully I pointed out that the discovery of the electron had just happened a few years beforehand, and so a couple of major things in physics were converging. The discovery of some atomic particles was one of those discoveries. Uh, the discovery, as, uh, as happened in uh, 1865 by James Clerk Maxwell when he discovered and, and produced his, his papers on the laws of, of electromagnetism, discoveries in basically wireless technology were beginning. And so it's the year 1900, and geopolitically, if you've done this in social studies at all, um, big things were happening in Europe. Uh, the European states were beginning to develop. Germany had become a country. Um, you've got a world power in the United Kingdom, Great Britain, London, England, right, being a major world power. But across the ocean, the United States of America is really starting to take hold. And, um, and anyways, that's kind of the context that I want to, to talk about here as I get through some of my history here. Um, before I get into that social studies context, though, I want to begin with this slide here. I should talk about the slide that's in front of us here. Um, as science helped to develop the technologies that we now have in the 21st century, this is the technologies that were being developed during the 20th century, so from the year 1900 to the year 2000, um, I want to just remind you what the scientific method is. The scientific method, as you can hopefully see here, involves beginning with observations, you know, discovering, wow, if I, if I do this, some, something seems to be happening. Creating a hypothesis, saying, okay, I wonder if I can make a rule that helps to describe these electromagnetic waves that I'm seeing, you know, and then an experiment. And that, that experiment basically goes through a process that takes one of two loops. Either at the conclusion of your experiment, I'm sorry this is blurry, but either your evidence is supported by the experiment you do, in which case you begin to develop a theory, like a theory of electromagnetism. Or maybe you have to reproduce the experiment. Or perhaps you have a conclusion that does not align with your hypothesis, and so you have to revise. And so this loop right here, I'll even grab the pen here just to draw that in here. This loop right here is really the fulcrum of the scientific method. The idea that when you do an experiment and you get a conclusion, you're always re-looping back again with hopefully the goal of being able to produce a theory on something. And so let's, let's talk historical context here. Historically, um, scientists were really struggling with this concept of light. We've been talking about electromagnetism over the last couple of weeks. Uh, light is one of, now we, we understand, to be many different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, from x-rays through radio waves and microwaves. And scientists have been grappling throughout the 19th century and the 18th century so that would be the year 1700s, the 1800s. They were grappling as to whether light was a particle or a wave. And um, we're going to discuss as we go through this course that light is actually neither a particle or a wave. It's actually a particle 
and a wave simultaneously. And we're eventually going to discuss something called duality, which is one of the fulcrums of quantum physics. And this is the stuff that I just love to teach. And usually students quite enjoy learning. Um, I don't know if it's been Thanksgiving when I record this video as to when you listen to it, but you ever have Thanksgiving and at the end of Thanksgiving, then it's dessert time and someone asks you, would you like to have, would you like to have pumpkin pie or would you like to have, you know, some cake? I don't know who serves cake at Thanksgiving. Anyways, pretend. And, you know, they're really phrasing it as an either or question where it's like, would you like pie or cake? But of course the answer is yes to that question. Would you like pie or cake? Yes, I would. I'd like both simultaneously. And there are certain things that in our world we can kind of envision as being both, but the essence of quantum physics is that something can be two things at the same time, which seem diametrically opposed. Now, I want to go back in history. Although light we now know is both a particle and a wave, back in the time of Sir Isaac Newton, so we're talking the 1700s, Sir Isaac Newton believed that light was a particle. He believed that light was, if you could freeze time and somehow quantify the little bits that make up light. He believed it was a particle. And and Sir Isaac Newton, just for a little historical context, back in the 1700s, um, Sir Isaac Newton was a giant in terms of both math and physics. If any of you are at the point right now where you're taking calculus, calculus was was devised, was was invented by Sir Isaac Newton. He was basically the best scientist you could ever have imagined during his time frame. And Sir Isaac Newton believed the light was a particle. And because Sir Isaac Newton believed it was a particle, basically everybody else had to go, yeah, sure, he's right. And, and no one really was willing to argue with Isaac Newton. And to be fair, Isaac Newton had great evidence as to why light was a particle. Um, it traveled in straight lines. I mean, just like if you throw a baseball. A baseball is a particle. It's made of particles. It, it's, it's matter. It's, it's a thing. Um, if I throw a baseball in a straight line, it's not going to just randomly start bending through the air. Okay, yes, you can throw a curveball, and we can talk about how different forces... Have, but, okay, if you get what I'm saying here, a shadow was a good proof that light traveled in straight lines because it doesn't really go around objects. And, and mirrors through reflection help to prove that light's a particle. And, and at that point, scientists knew that light was traveling to the Earth through the, from, from the sun, and they knew that in outer space there was nothing there. And so without a medium for something to travel through, they thought that light was made of particles. Or more specifically, Sir Isaac Newton believed that light was made of particles. And, and I want to go back to this first slide here. Based on the evidence that he had at the time, it was a very logical conclusion to suggest, to suggest that light was a particle. But that wasn't the end of the story, because after Sir Isaac Newton died, Scientists began discovering evidence to the contrary that suggested that light was more like a wave instead. The wave model of light started to take hold. And I wanted to share a, a small little anecdote. Um, you might have heard the name Robert Hooke. Robert Hooke was a scientist that lived around Newton's time. He was a contemporary. And um, Newton, um, being mostly involved in math and physics, um, Robert Hooke was actually a little of everything. He was a generalist. He studied biology. So you might have heard Hooke's name in, in biology classes. He's also involved in chemistry and physics. Anyways, Robert Hooke vehemently disagreed with, with, with Isaac Newton. And they actually had quite a rivalry. And, and I think this should actually help illustrate the point that no one dared challenge the great Sir Isaac Newton because, he, like, Newton buried Hooke. Like, literally, like, he, he tried to suppress Robert Hooke as a scientist, and it's actually believed that much of Robert Hooke's research is actually missing. And that that Robert Hooke did more work, and, Robert, and, and Isaac Newton, basically, he destroyed it. Um, one of the reasons people believe that is that every um, famous scientist from that time frame had a painting done of them, except for Robert Hooke. There, there's no painting ever found of Robert Hooke, and it's believed that Newton destroyed it due to his vengeance because Hooke disagreed with him. So under this thought process, during the 1700s, the 18th century, when, when Newton was around, no one dared ever say light is not a particle, and then Newton dies. And, um, and, I mean, it sounds so bad to frame it that way, but all of a sudden now scientists are a bit more willing to consider things that they had never considered before. So I want to share with you um, a couple of scientists, including one that we've already talked about. Um, so first one is Francesco Grimaldi, and he, he managed to show that actually light diffracts. And we've talked about diffraction before. Diffraction is the idea of a wave that's spreading out. 
in a wave front going outwards like this. We talked about that double slit experiment. And um, he managed to prove that shadows are not perfectly sharp. There's a bit of fuzziness to them where light is actually able to bend around a corner just a little bit. If you were to have a beam of light heading this way and you were to have a uh, something blocking it. So that's what this is meant to be. This is This is blocking it here. Well, you'd see that just a little bit of light's going to go around the corner. And you might be inclined to think that that light is going to go just like this. But slowly over time, as these waves bend outwards, if enough distance has passed, you might actually be able to discover that there is actually light right here. Right behind the screen, you'll actually discover some light because the light is bending out. I did not draw that well, but I, I hope you get what I mean. And um, this next example right here is another story that I love. I love these cool physics stories. I'm going to butcher the guy's name, so I apologize. But Simeon Poisson, uh, Simeon, Simeon Poisson predicted that light would not be able to go around a disk. He was a Newton follower. He believed what Newton believed. And um, Dominique Arego, I hope I said his name right, he actually found this spot. And I've got a photo here to kind of illustrate it. And because we've learned about diffraction, this will hopefully make sense. But light was basically traveling this direction. And light's also traveling this direction. And to be fair, it's traveling in all 360 degrees, of course. And so the light that's traveling this way here gets blocked by this disk. But what ends up happening is it creates a large shadow on, on a far wall. But light being a wave, as was being discovered, being a wave, it was eventually bending outwards as a wave front. And eventually the interference of this fairly weak light over here, it was very, very not concentrated anymore. And same thing over here, but the, 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 the overlap actually created this bright spot. And I, what I love about this is that Dominic Garego is the one who found it, but he doesn't name it after himself. In science, it's almost always a thing where scientists will... Sorry, there's an announcement coming over the PA system as I record this. I'm just going to pause for a second. So anyways, what ended up happening is Dominic Garego... He ended up, uh, he named this, this spot that he found, he named it after um, uh, Poisson because Poisson was a non-believer. And so, I mean, most of the time, scientists will name things after themselves. And Arrego didn't, he named it after his buddy. And like, this is the first example of someone throwing shade at somebody else. I mean, I'm sorry that I'm giving a bad pun here, but like this was literally an experiment about things being found in the shade. <laughs> I hope you get this. I hope you're laughing. And um, yeah, because they were able to find this bright spot right here, thereby proving that light was no longer just a particle, but also acted as a wave. Uh, yeah, anyways, Arego names it after his friend. Um, we've also talked about uh, the idea of light being refracted, and the famous Dutch scientist Christian Huygens, he managed to prove that if you had 100% light coming in, if, say, 30% of it was transmitted through refraction, through the bending of it, that the remaining 70% of it, it was reflected. He managed to prove that these two amounts right here, the amount that was reflected, which really suggests particle behavior, and the amount that is refracted or transmitted, which suggests wave behavior, he, he, he discovered that it actually added up to the original amount. And then the final scientist I want to share with you, which, which was our previous topic, the infamous double slit experiment done in the year 1800. So again, we're talking post Isaac Newton, really helped to solidify the idea that light was a wave. So now to come back to 100 years from that, the year 1900, scientists are now grappling with this problem of, is light a wave or is light a particle? Because they have evidence for both. And I, I love this little image that I've got here. If, you, if you're not visualizing it here, here's P, here's A, R, T, I, C, L, E. So here's light being a particle, but... We also have evidence that light is also a wave. And this is the beginning of quantum physics. I hope you can see the word wave in there. And again, going back to the scientific method, the scientific method by its very nature requires that as more experimentation happens and you come to different conclusions, you have to basically keep the process going. And so during the 19th century, scientists have radically different views about whether light is a particle or a wave. And I've already spoiled the ending. We're going to learn eventually about how light is actually both simultaneously through quantum physics. But I want to basically talk here. Um, here we go. 
about this time in history. So it's the year now 1900. And science has undergone, I'm just reading my slide here, it's undergone a period of incredible discovery. And so here are some of the scientists who have made some theories that are pretty concrete. One, Sir Isaac Newton has explained the motion of objects through his three laws of motion. Objects in motion stay in motion. Force is mass times acceleration. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction force. Kepler has his laws about the celestial bodies traveling throughout the heavens. Maxwell puts together this elegant theory of electromagnetism proved by Heinrich Hertz about 20 years later. And it's the year 1900 and physicists are starting to pat themselves on the back saying, guys, we've figured out the universe. And what I love about the story of physics is how many times scientists thought they were right and, and they weren't right. Um, this is a quote by Sir William Thompson that was given at a lecture around the turn of the 20th century, so the year 1900. Uh, you might recognize William Thompson by his, his other name. He was Lord Kelvin. Any of you who've taken chemistry might recognize the name Lord Kelvin, and I'll read the quote here. He said, there is nothing new to be discovered in physics now. All that remains is more and more precise measurement. And, and we've talked a bit about some of those measurements that were being done. For example, um, the speed of light was being determined. Scientists were still not quite sure whether light was a particle or a wave, but measuring the speed of light, they were becoming more and more exact with it. You know, that was, a, that was an experiment that was being refined. And so there were very few problems left in classical physics to be determined. Scientists believe they had solved all of them. And really one of the only problems left to solve was the problem of is light a particle or a wave? You know, that was a, that was one of the few left to be checked off. People like Sir William Thompson, Lord, Lord Kelvin, they believed that... Excuse me, interruption. Can we have grade 9 boys volleyball to the conference room now? Again, all grade 9 boys volleyball. I'm just recording and there's announcements happening over top of me here. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm just going to have to re-record this a little bit here. So Sir William Thompson and his contemporaries at this time, he believed that... Um, they believed that really there was nothing left to solve. They, they check off these last few boxes. If they manage to solve the puzzle of light being a particle or a wave, if we can check off these remaining ones, then uh, we're good to go. And so I want to introduce you to a problem that was happening around this time. Again, European Europe, Europe is thriving. Uh, Germany is a country. And the United States is really growing. And the problem that I want to introduce to you that scientists were struggling to solve, one of the few remaining ones left, was the light bulb. And again, this is why I began with the, the historical context at the time. This was a rapid period of innovation. Um, companies in the United States especially, Thomas Edison, the developer of the light bulb, you might have heard his quote where he said, I don't need to find, uh, how did he phrase it? He said, I found a, a thousand ways not to make a light bulb, but all I've got to do is find one that does work. And I know I, I butchered his quote. You may, you've heard that one maybe before. The light bulb was being invented, and this had drastic changes to society because, I mean, for one, New York all of a sudden became this hubbub, this metropolitan city where there was a nightlife, right? I mean, I want you to think of what life was like 120 years ago, basically. Um, if there was, if, if the sun set and you wanted to be out and about after sunset, I mean, you basically had a few major options. You, you could try to navigate by moonlight. Uh, you could take a lantern out, like say a kerosene lantern, um, you know, some sort of candle, something that's lit by fire. But of course, that's a little dangerous. Uh, the moon might not remain out at all times. And, and then of course, there's the, of course the werewolf problem, being silly, of course, um, <laughs> right? But you've got moonlight to navigate by, you've got a lantern to navigate by. And all of a sudden now this new technology, the light bulb comes out and this just revolutionizes things because now New York and London and Paris these metropolitan centers, they're putting out street lights, right? And now people are staying out late after dark and they're going to the opera. I know that might not sound exciting to us, but like, like this is a time when Tchaikovsky and Stravinsky are around and like being able to go out to the theater is exciting, right? Now, anyways, I'm getting, I'm getting way off topic. I love telling the story. I apologize here as I tell it to a computer screen, of course. Um, scientists are struggling with this light bulb because they know that it works. Um, Thomas Edison, as, as his famous quote was, he just needed to find one way that made a light bulb work, and he found one. But scientists didn't fully understand how it worked. They just knew that they managed to make it produce light. And so I'm beginning with this slide here to point out that we now know, you know, 120 years later, that there's actually different 
shades of light out of a light bulb. And maybe you have different types of light bulbs that you've seen that you can buy when you go to Walmart or Canadian Tire. There's, there's soft white, there's bright light, there's daylight. And the reason I threw this on here is because it's often corresponding to this. 2,700, 3,000, and 5,000 K. And I've actually mentioned this guy's name just a few minutes ago. The K, Lord Kelvin, is a measure of temperature. And what we, we what was being developed in an understanding of at the time is that the hotter that you heated up the filament in a light bulb, it would produce a different color. That's what that's what scientists around the turn of the century were discovering is that as you heated up your light bulb through different temperatures, you were getting a different hue, H-U-E, a different hue of light. Sometimes it was a white light, sometimes it was a blue light, sometimes it was more of a yellow light, and scientists were trying to figure out why. I mean, keep in mind, at this time in history, no one cared why, from a practical point of view, people were just like, we have light bulbs. You can see it was a very, very big advancement technology-wise, but scientists were trying to figure out why. And um, there, there's a graph now that I'm going to share with you. This is what modern scientists understand, and this is beyond the scope of our course, by the way. Please don't look at this formula here and go, holy crap, Chris, what's going on here? Um, this is not a formula that we use. But we now understand that light bulbs give off a certain amount of intensity based off of different color spectrums um, per temperature. And so if you have a light bulb that's operating at, say, 6,000 Kelvin, you're going to have a little bit of purple light and a little bit of blue light, but you're going to have mainly green and yellow light. You're also going to have a little bit of red light. And so the peak of the light that's given off at 6,000 Kelvin is going to be right here. And because of the fact that most of the colors of the rainbow are accounted for, well, not most, all of the colors of the rainbow are accounted for here, this light will appear very white, maybe even bluish. Whereas here's a light bulb that's operating at 4,000 Kelvin. And so it's still going to produce color, but you'll notice that its spectrum as it goes up and down right here, its max wavelength intensity right here is actually outside of the colors that we see. We're actually, it's actually producing infrared. And so does the light bulb that's at 3000 Kelvin. It's actually producing more heat in, in the infrared spectrum than it actually is producing color. And so a light bulb like this one right here at 4000 Kelvin, it might be producing more of the orangish type colors. And a 3000 Kelvin light bulb might be producing, producing more of a red type color. And I wanna go back here, you can kind of see that, is that this light right here has got more of a reddish hue to it versus a yellow hue and a blue hue. And so we, we now know this. And I mean, scientists at the time were also discovering that different like colors of light were being produced, but they couldn't figure out why or how. And one of the reasons why is that under classical physics, the understanding at the time was that this was a formula. And again, we don't actually use this formula. I have no idea how it works. I mean, I understand that T is temperature, C is the speed of light. I'm not even sure what this V stands for. It's not velocity. Um, pi, I know pi, <laughs> right? I don't need you to know this formula. Um, what I do need you to know, though, is that at the time, there was a law that had been understood about how much temperature, T for temperature, there was in Kelvins. And Raleigh Jean's law basically had a relationship, but that relationship didn't work. And as scientists were trying to piece together the mathematical understanding as to how this looked, they couldn't explain why they were getting different colors. They actually expected that you would get more and more and more and more intensity and that it would infinitely go up based on frequency. And we've hopefully been learning about regression. At the time, they were probably under the assumption that the regression was either linear or this looks exponential. They expected it to keep going upwards. And that's not what happened. What they discovered is that the curve went up, but then it came back down again as they were checking out their data. And it did not agree with what the expected modeling was. Just like when we do linear regressions and quadratic regressions in our graphing calculator, the classical modeling predicted an increase for forever. And as we're going to talk about in the next few slides, quantum physics modeling suggested that actually the curve came back down again, and they couldn't explain why at all. And so the, um, the, the, the concept here is, is, is the name of our topic for today's lesson. It's called black body radiation. 
So I need to talk a bit about what a black body radiator is to try and explain what scientists were grappling with around the turn of the century. See, a black body is an object that's supposed to absorb all of the electromagnetic radiation that strikes it. But as it absorbs that energy, I mean, if it keeps absorbing energy and absorbing energy and absorbing energy, it's going to heat up. And as the object heats up, the atoms are going to vibrate. And I mean, really, the vibration of atoms is, is heat. And so as it heats up and it gets warmer and warmer and warmer, eventually it's going to then release and give back energy. And that's what we actually recognize when you do something like you heat up a horseshoe in a forge. Or you ever looked at the element of a stove? Not a gas stove, but one of those stoves where it glows red? You're seeing a black body. It's an object that is absorbing energy, absorbing energy, absorbing energy. And as it absorbs the energy and as its temperature increases, there's that word again, temperature increases, it's giving off a certain color again. And so according to classical physics, they made a prediction that as the frequency of the EMR increases, so should its intensity, creating a linear relationship. And so there was a prediction. Do I have that graph somewhere here? Here it was. They made a prediction that as you increase the frequency of the EMR that you're seeing, it should become more and more intense. And this was logical because the lowest frequency that you're going to be able to have originally is infrared. And then the next frequency after that is red which is why eventually if you heat something up enough, it no longer just gives off infrared, it'll actually glow red, like, like a horseshoe does in this photo right back here, right? And then after that, you should then hopefully get maybe some yellow. And I have a photo of that right here, where like maybe you can heat something up so much that it actually glows a yellow color, right? And so people suggested, well, what comes after red, orange, yellow, green, and then blue, and then violet? and then ultraviolet, they were predicting that as you keep heating things up more and more and more, if you add more and more heat, you would get more intensity, but instead that's not what happened, and they couldn't explain why. Okay, I want to talk about um, color theory for a little bit just to make sure we deepen our understanding of this. I'm going to go to this slide right here. I want to talk about what happens when you see colors. Okay, um, When you're seeing the color red, unless the object is thousands of degrees Kelvin, like our sun, or like something that is really hot or warm, um, when you're seeing red, what you're really seeing is an object that is absorbing all of the wavelengths of light except for red. And so when you know visible light bounces off a red object, it, it's coming in with red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple wavelengths. White light is all of the colors of the rainbow. What you're seeing is red light being given off and reflected by that surface. White objects reflect all colors of the rainbow, and black objects absorb all colors of the rainbow, right? And so I just want to point out that that's traditionally how we see colors, but what I'm talking about right now is that we can also see a color through the means of heating an object up. And I, I want to talk about how James Maxwell's theory explains this, because James Maxwell put together a theory that suggests that when electrons are vibrating, the frequency at which they're vibrating will then produce EMR. And so if you have low frequency electron vibrations, you're going to give off radio waves. And then if you increase those waves, you might get microwaves. And if you have high vibrating electrons, you might give off x-rays. Well, a black body is an object that's being heated up. And as it's being heated up, the atoms are vibrating faster. And I mean, we're going to talk about subatomic theory as we keep delving into this course, but we now know that atoms are made up of electrons and protons. And as those electrons and protons are vibrating, well, then of course they're going to give off electromagnetic radiation because you have vibrating electrons when things are being heated. And so if you vibrate them enough, you'll create visible light. This is a picture of, of some sort of wolf or dog, and this is a thermal imaging scan. And, and everything is actually giving off infrared. You and me just by existing as human beings and being about, you know, 30 something degrees Celsius, you know, I think 90, 98 Fahrenheit is probably normal body temperature for a human being. That's 98 Fahrenheit there, degrees Fahrenheit. Just you and I, by our natural body temperatures, we're actually giving off infrared radiation right now, right? We're black bodies in a way. We are absorbing energy and we are then re-emitting it in the form of our heat. And so this thermal imaging scan will tell you where the, where the hot spots are, you know, the ears, the eyes, the mouth, right? 
And so to go back to this concept right here, infrared radiation was expected to be given off. We know that. Heated up more, you give off red. Heated up more, you give off yellow. Well, they expected if you just keep heating things, eventually you'll give off green light and blue light and violet light and then ultraviolet light. And it didn't. What was observed in experiments is that it just stopped right at ultraviolet. And this was known as the ultraviolet catastrophe. It was called a catastrophe, almost ironically, um, because it's actually a good thing. If you keep heat, heating things up more and more and more and eventually could give off ultraviolet, you could then eventually give off X-rays and you could then give off um, um, cosmic rays and gamma radiation. And that's not what we see, which is good because those are actually really dangerous for us. We, we don't actually want to be able to heat things up so hot that they give off X-rays, right? Can you imagine turning on your stove and the stove starts to glow red, but you accidentally turn it up too much and it glows yellow and then it glows blue and then it glows purple and then eventually it, it glows X-ray. Wouldn't that be horrible to X-ray your, yourself by accident by heating something up too much? And that's what this, this paragraph right here basically says is black bodies don't actually radiate all frequencies. The deadly X-rays and gamma rays aren't given off. It just, it, the, the graph dropped, which didn't match the modeling, the linear regression modeling that we've been learning about for the last little while, it didn't match. And scientists had no explanation why. They couldn't explain why. And so enters Max Planck. See, Max Planck, he was actually um, hired by the German government uh, in, the, in the 1890s to basically work on light bulbs and try and improve light bulb technology because Germany wanted to be a, a world power and as, as, you know, again, the United States and France and, and all these countries that kind of rose to prominence pre-World War I, all of these countries were basically trying to industrialize and develop modern and sophisticated technology. Like I said, I mean, if you were a country that was able to um, offer a nightlife where people could, um, you know, have these socialite gatherings to the midnight hours, and and not just by candlelight, but via um, you know via via electricity. I mean that that gave you that gave you power and prestige, right? Anyways, back to my story here. So Max Planck, his job was to try and investigate this light bulb kind of phenomenon. They were the light bulbs were working by all means. They were working, but they were trying to make them improve. They were trying to make them better. Right. And so I'll read off this slide right here. I rarely read off my slides, but I want to read this right here. Up until this point, everyone was assuming that those vibrating electrons that were absorbing and re-emitting black body radiation, they thought they could vibrate at any frequency at all. All frequencies are valid. Max Planck had a radical idea. He suggested that maybe energy, there was a minimum amount of energy that EMR could transfer to the matter. And he suggested for the first time something called a quantum which was the birth of quantum physics. The idea that there is a smallest bit that you can have. Now, there are some similar sort of analogies in the other sciences. For example, in chemistry, the smallest bit that we work with is probably the periodic table, you know. And in biology, the smallest bit that you work with is probably a cell. Now, we do recognize that, well, actually, the periodic table is made up of protons and neutrons and, and cells are made of organelles. But basically, he was suggesting that there was a fundamental smallest amount of something. And he suggested that energy was quantized. Now, I'm going to come back to this formula in a second, but I want to use this analogy to talk about it. See, in classical physics, people were suggesting that any possible energy value was, was allowable. And so if you wanted to have 3.179 joules of energy, go for it. There's nothing wrong with it. I just need to get my board to write here. So if you wanted to have 3.1457, it's almost like I wrote pi, joules, you say that's possible. A any number is possible. These numbers, they go on to an infinity. You can find any number on a number line. And what Max Planck was suggesting is that numbers were more like incremental steps, where, for example, you could have 3.14, you could have 3.16, you could have 3.18, you could have 3.20. But if you wanted to find 3.19 joules, that that was not possible. Now, this is radical because it's suggesting that, like, there are certain increments that are not valid on a number line. When, when you learn about math 
and you learn about all of the numbers on a number line. So you have like zero in the middle, and you have one, and you have negative one. In math, you're presuming that right here there exists a number, or let's do a positive number. Right here there exists the number 3.097237. It suggests that that number exists. And mathematically, of course it exists. But what Max Planck was suggesting is that from an energy port of point of view, that many joules of energy was not possible. It had to be in increments. That's the word I want you to think of, is that it had to come in specific increments. And I don't know if I'm spelling the word increments right. I hope I do it right. But this is actually kind of similar to the electron problem that we've talked about, where um, charge has to be done in increments of 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19, Max Planck suggests, well, maybe energy has to come in these small little increments. Now, the best way that I've been able to visualize this is with cups of water. You'll have to bear with me. If this example does not make sense, I apologize. But what they're basically suggesting is that if you have a cup of water, the cup of water has to be filled all the way up. So imagine that this is a one liter cup of water. You have to have a one liter cup of water. You cannot take the cup and fill it partially up and say, oh, I have half of a liter of water. What you're saying is that if you have a cup, it is filled all the way up. Now, it's possible to have one liter increments. It's possible to have two liter increments. It's even possible to have a increment of half a liter, but you'd have to use a cup that is a half liter cup. But what it's suggesting is if you're talking about a bundle of energy, whatever amount of energy you're talking about has to be um, completely filled to its max capacity and you can't have portions of what that is. It's a very strange concept. Now, here's what Max Planck suggested then. He suggested a constant of 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34. And he suggested that this will help us figure out the increments in which energy can go up by. Now, I wanna pause for a second just to talk about the scope of this number. Um, the electron, which had only just been discovered recently, Oh, so it's supposed to be E. Uh, this is an E. And, and the electron, it wasn't determined to be 1.6 to the minus 19 for about another decade. But we now know that this amount of charge for an electron, that's the minus 19. Well, what Max Planck is suggesting is that energy is quantized like, we're not talking doubled. Doubled would be to the minus 20. We're talking like orders of magnitude smaller. He's suggesting that this is the smallest number. And I want to go back as to why. See, Max Planck with the math that had been understood at the time, the Rayleigh-Jean line, the Rayleigh-Jean law, it was understood that this right here was what they expected based on temperature and intensity and frequency. Well, Max Planck basically makes a new formula involving his constant. His constant is now given the letter H, and H is that value that I just pointed out. It's 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34. And what I find interesting about this story is that Max Planck didn't do any experiments to determine what H was. He just guessed and checked a number that fit into the formula that he made up. And you'll notice that it's very similar. The formula for Rayleigh-Jean's law and the formula that he made up are almost identical, minus a little bit of tweaks. And he basically guessed and checked numbers until it fit the curve. Because at the time, scientists were under the impression that this curve would kind of go on and on and on forever. And so he basically, he devised a constant and said, hey guys, I made a bench to make it fit. And it worked. I mean, it managed to, to fit in terms of how things worked. And so here's his formula. His formula is that, ew, I didn't mean to draw that. Let's just erase that. His formula is that the energy that you get comes, on, comes in quantized amounts. It comes in increments of 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34, but you have to multiply it by the frequency of the light that you have. And so what this means is that red light might be, if, if you use my cup example, red light might be coming in increments of like say one liter, but blue light might be coming in increments of two liters. And so it really depends on what frequency you have as to what the smallest bit of energy is possible. So I've got a couple of examples to help with this. And this is probably gonna require some conversations between me and you, because this is the birth of quantum physics. And so I don't mean to be 
cruel by saying this, but like quantum physics is not easy to wrap your head around by any means. So if you are lost at the end of this lesson here, don't feel bad. It just means that we need to talk some more. And hopefully I'll be able to help it click at some point. So I want to do an example here. Let's figure out the smallest bit of energy that comes from a light source emitting light at a frequency of 4.5 times 10 to the 14 hertz. So according to Max Planck's formula, the smallest bit of energy you get will be his constant times by a frequency. So his constant was 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34, and that was in joule seconds. If we then multiply that by a frequency of 4.50 times 10 to the 14 hertz, which is basically a, a unit that is per second, the seconds cancels, and you're left with the amount of energy that you're able to work with. So I'm just going to plug this into a calculator here, and we will figure out how much that is. Okay, so by multiplying those two numbers together, I have calculated do, 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 two point. 0.89 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. And so basically what we're suggesting is for this particular frequency of light, this is the smallest amount that it can come in. Now, man, if your head is not able to wrap your head around it, that's okay. Um, give me a little bit more time to give some more analogies and more examples to try and try and figure this out. But the first thing I want to point out is that that number is incredibly small. And so scientists already have another way of measuring energy. You might know that 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 is, if, if that's how many joules you have, that's equal to one electron volt. We've learned about this in a previous unit. And so rather than measuring things always to the scope of minus 19, which seems to be where quantum physics is at the scope of, uh, we're going to measure it in, in better increments. So I'm going to do another example here. And I'm just going to make a couple of changes here. What we're going to talk about here is a particular type of wave. And so this is going to be ultraviolet light. 212 nanometers is going to be ultraviolet light. And we're going to talk about how much energy comes in a small packet of, of ultraviolet light. Okay. Again, bear with me as I work on things. So the formula is E equals HF. But I'm actually giving you a wavelength. And so using the universal wave equation that velocity is equal to frequency times wavelength, I can solve my frequency for velocity on wavelength. But because it's the speed of light, I can make it C over wavelength because it's, it's light, it's traveling the speed of light, which means my formula can then be H times C over wavelength. And so I'm gonna basically take this formula here, HC over wavelength, and I'm gonna do the exact same thing. I'm gonna solve for how many joules of energy comes there, but then I'm gonna, I'm gonna continue from there. So bear with me here as I kind of keep trying to teach this, this, this concept, it's hard. Okay, here's my Planck's constant. I'm going to times by the speed of light, which is known to be about 3 times 10 to the 8. And I'm going to divide about by the 212 nanometer wavelength. Nanometers is to the power of minus 9. So I'm going to solve this for how much energy comes in a packet of ultraviolet light. 663 times 10 to the minus 34 times 3 times 10 to the 8 divided by 212 to the minus 9. And again, I'm to the minus 19. I ended up getting 9.38 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. Now, I'm going to actually solve for this, though, in electron volts, because this is getting annoying, being to the power of minus 19. So if I divided by 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19, which is the conversion ratio from joules to electron volts, divided by 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19, uh, I have 5.86 electron volts. And so this is for ultraviolet light. Okay, now I want to talk about what this means. In my water cup analogy, what it means is that you have to have multiples of 5.86 if you're using ultraviolet light. So I'm going to draw a bit of a picture here. Say you have ultraviolet light coming in. What Max Planck was suggesting is that there were small little bits making up this wave, or maybe they were particles. We're going to revisit that again in a few minutes here. But whatever was making up this wave, they came in increments of 5.86s. So this was a 5.86, and the next one is a 5.86, and the next one is a 5.86. And when you add a billion of them together, you'll get a certain amount. Now, this is at the microscopic, at the fundamental quantum level. He's suggesting that is the smallest incremental amount you can have for ultraviolet light. 
So in terms of my water cup analogy, this particular cup of water holds 5.86 liters, but it has to be full all the way. So you can have three cups of water, you could have 17 cups of water, you could have 4.3 billion cups of water, but each one of those cups is 5.86 liters. What Max Planck is suggesting though is that every wavelength, every frequency has its own size to it. Now, five years later, Albert Einstein hears about this concept and he builds on it and he gives it a name. He gives it the name photon, which I might have even already used before in this class, the idea of a photon. Uh, he basically suggests again that light is no longer a wave again, but light is a particle. And he coins the term photon to describe this particle nature of light, which I mean, going back to where we began this whole journey 45 minutes ago, and I recognize it's been going for a while, but we began this journey by talking about the fact that scientists were under the impression that it was either a wave or it was a particle, this light concept. Sir Isaac Newton suggests light is a particle. Then other scientists suggest light is a wave. And now all of a sudden, Einstein is back to the idea of, well, maybe light is both a wave and a particle simultaneously. And often you see it drawn like this, where you see almost like a wave being drawn inside of a particle. And that's kind of the best way that we can describe the idea that light has a wavelength and a frequency, so therefore it's a wave, but it comes in packets, one at a time. Strange concept. I wanna try another example here. So let's talk about red light. We've already done ultraviolet. Ultraviolet, you might remember, was 212 nanometers for ultraviolet. And it means that each individual particle or photon of light carries with it 5.86 electron volts of energy, one at a time. So if these light packets right here were ultraviolet, this would be 5.86, and this would be 5.86, and you'd be 5.86. Sorry, I'm getting excited here. That's what we're suggesting, if this was an ultraviolet flashlight. Well, what happens if it's not an ultraviolet flashlight? What happens if it's a red flashlight and it's a laser that's shooting red light out of it? Well, again, it's gonna shoot out photons, but those photons that you have, each individual packet of them is gonna come in different increments, different multiples. So let's calculate that. The formula is the same as what we just did last time. It's E equals HC over wavelength. So it'll be 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34. We're gonna multiply by the speed of light, three times 10 to the eight. And we'll divide by the frequency of our light, which is red light. So it'll be 600 nanometers, which is a nano is minus nine. And I'm gonna calculate this particular energy. So 663 to the minus 34 times three to the eight. Ooh, my calculator died. Ooh, my calculator is dead. Okay, so calculating that out, I've got, oh, and now I've lost my pen. <laughs> Okay, so calculating this out, 663, 3 to the 8, 600, I calculated a value of 3.315 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. Now, again, measuring things in increments of minus 19 is annoying, so I'm going to convert this to electron volts just so that my mind can probably process it a little bit better. So if I divide this by 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19, I've got 2.07. Let's talk about what this means. 2.07 electron volts. Well, that means that if you have 600 nanometer, which is red light, it comes in incremental chunks of 2.07 electron volts. That's a seven. Which means that going back to this picture right here, each of these photons of light that you're seeing, this is a 2.07, and this is a 2.07, and they're all 2.07s when you see a red laser. Now, I want to talk a bit about white light. When you're seeing white light, well, you're seeing all sorts of amounts, right? Some of the light is red, some of it's orange, some of it's green, some of it's blue, and you're seeing it combined as white. But if I were to extend this photo and just do a regular flashlight, which is shooting white light, then this one right here might be a 2.07. That's, that's a red photon. But I might also get a photon over here that's a 5.12. And I might get one over here that's a 4.33, right? Now, going back to the color spectrum here then, this graph right here, when you see a certain color of light overall, 
what this right here over here on the axis then for intensity is telling you is it's telling you how many what proportion of each type of photon you're able to see and so when you have this 5000 kelvin light bulb it means that many of the photons are red photons but there's also some yellow photons and there's also some green photons and there's also some purple photons uh, there's also some ultraviolet photons there's also some infrared. You'll notice that in this graph right here, this is infrared. Over here, this is where microwaves would be. Over here, this is ultraviolet, and then there'd be gamma. You'll notice, by the way, that all of these come and hit the axis right here. This was that ultraviolet catastrophe, is that you really don't get anything past ultraviolet. Photons, X-ray photons, are not given off by increasing more and more temperature. So this was basically Max Planck's way of being able to reconcile that challenge is that what if this color smear that you're seeing here was actually made up of these little particles again? And, but the particles have a wavelength. I wanna point out that Albert Einstein's classic drawing of a photon, which looks like this, which is like a wave inside of a particle, it does not imply that there is a wave inside of a particle. It suggests that that particular wave is acting as a particle. And so there is a stream of, of continual chunks of energy. Man, it's weird to get wrap your head around, right? Going back to the water cup analogy then, red light always comes in increments of 2.07. And so you have one 2.07. You can't fill this energy only halfway up and make the energy be 1.02. That's not possible. Red doesn't come in increments of 1.02, but you can have it be multiples of 2.07s, right? Now, again, these are electron volts, which means that they are to the order of minus 19. Normally, you're gonna have energy that's way more than to the power of minus 19, but this would be in its individual smallest piece, right? So when you put all of them together, normally you're going to have four joules, and you're not really going to care that it came in increments that were really small, right? In the same way that when I talk about matter that's around us, and I say, well, this table is made up of car carbons and hydrogens, you'd go, yeah, I, I guess it is, but like, I can't see them because like, there's just so many of them, it doesn't really matter. And in the same way that you talk about biology, the smallest incremental thing in biology is a cell. But when you look at a living thing, you're seeing billions upon trillions of cells. So you don't really overly care what a single one looks like. But that's kind of the analogy for physics is that individual pieces of energy, light specifically, come in packets. Okay, I'm gonna do one last example here and then that's actually it for this lesson. I am gonna presume that you probably have some questions and that this concept is a little bit cloudy. Um, I want to encourage you to ask, but we'll do one last question. Let's say there's a laser with a frequency of this and it runs at four milliwatts. Let's figure out how many photons it can spit out in a second. So, I mean, I've already done the flashlight analogy. Let's imagine that this is just a laser and the laser is going to start spitting out these photons of light. And so, I mean, although you can think of it as being a wave, Maybe think of it as being as, as packets of there's one right here and there's one right here. And presuming that it's just shooting one frequency. So as these are coming out here, we're going to try to figure out how many it's going to shoot out of this laser here in one second. And so our formula is actually one we rarely use. Power is equal to work divided by time. And the reason I thought to use power is because it's talking about watts. So power is the watts value, and one second right here is my time. So I kind of know power, I kind of know time, which will get me work. But through the work energy theorem, you might know that work is equivalent to energy. And energy is equivalent to H times F. So I can really build myself a formula that says that power is going to be equal to H times F over T. With one little twist, though, is that HF is the amount that you get for one photon. It's the energy in one photon. So I'm gonna put a number sign right here. Sometimes people put an N there, but the number of photons that I have multiplied by HF over T, that's how much power it'll be. Because obviously I don't just have one photon, I'm gonna have many of these photons streaming out of a laser. So therefore, if I want to solve for the number of photons there, there will be, the math for this will be power multiplied by time divided by Planck's constant and my frequency. 
right? That's your math, cross multiplying, dividing thing. So my power is four milliwatts. So that's four times 10 to the minus three. Milla minus three. One second, I'm timesing by one, that's kind of pointless. Uh, Planck's constant, it comes in increments of 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34. And if I multiply by my frequency, which is 4.38 times 10 to the 15, this should then tell me how many of these incremental particles are coming out. So let's do that. 4 times 10 to the minus 3 divided by 663 to the minus 34, also divided by 438 to the 15. And I got this number here. I got 1.38 times 10 to the 15. And that's how many photons there are. There are that many photons popping out of this laser. As this laser is shooting out photons over and over and over again, there are that many photons. Now, if I wanted to talk about how much energy each of those photons has, I could also do that. I could go E equals HF. Um, it'll be 663 times 10 to the minus 34. If I multiply by the frequency, which was 4.38 times 10 to the 15, and if I were to divide by 1.6 to the minus 19, just to make it be in electron volts, I'm just going to tell you how much energy each of those photons has. So 663 to the power of minus 34, multiplied by 438 to the power of 15, divided by 1.6 to the minus 19. Uh, I got 18 electron volts, let's say. So as the laser is shooting out all of these photons, this one is 18 electron volts of energy. And this one is 18 electron volts worth of energy. This one is 18 electron volts worth of energy. And collectively, they're going to make lots of energy. But as a one piece at a time, they're actually very small. And again, the way that the story concludes then is that by breaking energy up into this pictural concept here of energy being in incremental pieces coming in chunks determined by Planck's constant, which he just guessed at. You ever do a math problem and like you don't actually get the right answer? And what you end up doing is like you just kind of start trying random stuff until somehow it works. I don't know if you've ever experienced this before. We're like, you just guess and check possibilities until maybe finally something works. And then if the teacher asks you to like prove why, it's you're, you're kind of faking it a little bit. That's basically what Max Planck did is Max Planck wanted to reconcile this data right here, which was expected to be linear, but instead dropped off in the ultraviolet catastrophe. He wanted to reconcile that. And so he made up a brand new constant. He made up a brand new formula which was this formula here rather than this one here. And the difference is his constant and, and it worked. He was able to then answer the question of how do we predict what sort of light we're gonna get out of our light bulbs. He was able to do that. He was able to predict using a picture like this that you're getting a certain amount of red particles and a certain amount of yellow particles and a certain amount of blue particles. And he was able to make that prediction. So anyways, I'm going to leave our story there because this video is running on an hour minus whatever I need to edit here. So as always, I'm going to challenge you to, um, to ask me some questions, to pause this video. In terms of the formulas that we use, there's just the one. Well, kind of two, I guess. We use this formula E equals HF, and sometimes we change out for this HC over wavelength. The formula is very simple. Understanding what the heck is going on, though, that's going to take a while for us to reconcile. The good news is we have an entire second half of our course all about quantum physics. And so we're going to continue that journey in, in our second half of our year. So anyways, I'll sign out here. Um, as always, please, please ask me some questions. All right, take care, everybody.